I'd like to welcome you here today. I'm Elizabeth Sackler, and this is, of course, the Elizabeth A. Sackler Center for Feminist Art, and today's program, Tribute to the Disappeared. Introductions and my introductions for programming are, are very important to me um, because I feel that they create a context and they uh, set the stage for the program that you're about to hear. Um, but as I was thinking about what I might like to say today, I realized that um, there are three things that are very true. I think the fact that we have this full room attests to my three points. One is that the state of political realities and the electoral process that is going on right now is one of the stages that is set. The second is the state of the world at large. When I speak to friends who are in Europe, they're talking about apocalyptic migrations of refugees and the refugee crisis. So that sets a stage. The third, um, there have been over the years uh, books and films about regimes, about coups that tell the stories of those who have been disappeared. And I brought today, and I'll pass them around, but you can't keep them. You have to throw them in the back because they're going home with me. The Ministry of Special Cases by Nathan Englander. And if you haven't read it, you might want to hear about what happened in Brazil. Missing, some of you who are my age might remember Missing, which is about the American-assisted coup in El Salvador. This film came out in the 1980s, and it's easily available on Amazon, and it's amazing, unfortunately, that the more things change, the more they stay the same, and they're coming closer to home. So I'll pass that down so you can see it and take a note. And the third is Z. Many of you may or may not remember that there was a coup in Greece in the late 1960s. When I mentioned this to somebody who was of a younger generation significantly, a couple of decades younger than I, said I didn't even know there was a coup. Well, I had the good fortune actually of being in Greece before the coup on a number of occasions. And, um, it was a significant change. So this is something that might interest you because as we look around at our own landscape, uh, we're not accustomed to coups in this country. So I don't know whether or not we know what they look like when we see them. In any event, uh, in this world you don't disappear, or in these worlds, you are disappeared. And that is very, significant. I'd like to read to you, this was uh, for anybody who might have seen it on uh, WNS, uh, NBC, NBCnews.com. I'm going to read this to you because it really speaks to, to Andrea and her work. As the parents of 43 missing students protest in front of Mexico's Supreme Court Friday on the 17-month anniversary of their son's disappearance, a Mexican artist in New York asks Americans to reflect on the ways Mexico and the United States are connected. This is a quote. We are all connected with what happens in different places, says Andrea Arroyo in a phone interview with NBC Latino. We all benefit from the laws and privileges of our government, and we should also be aware of how those laws and privileges make us complicit in the exploitation of different people around the world. Arroyo, who is the curator of an art project that honors the disappeared from Mexico and other victims of violence and injustice worldwide, will co-host a roundtable, and here we are, with Isabella Martinez, who I welcome and thank, from, who is an associate professor at uh, John Jay College of Criminal Justice. And they're here to talk about using art to empower people socially and politically. Uh, the article continues, today you can do something, Arroyo said, explaining how art can help people express their convictions. 
and that something I am doing is putting my brush on paper to contribute with my creativity, creativity to the struggle of the families and the struggles of other people fighting for justice. The art project, Tribute to the Disappeared, now features more than 300 artists from all over the world and was inspired by the AIDS Memorial Quilt, which started in 1987 as a way to document people whose stories were largely neglected. Arroyo explained that when people feel alone, alienated, art has the power to connect them immediately with other perspectives and experiences. And Tribute to the Disappeared aims to connect the stories of the 43 students who disappeared on September 26, 2014, with the hundreds of women who were murdered, as well as other communities, including Nicaragua, where mass killings have been underreported by the government and the media. Martinez, who is writing a book about undocumented immigrant youth, also sees connections between the stories of the 43 students with Michael Brown, an 18-year-old black man whose family, who was fatally shot by a white police officer in Ferguson, Missouri. We now come to think of before Ferguson and after, I think, in our country. And over 13,000 immigrant youths facing deportation proceedings in New York from 2012 to 2016. If you take a look at the underlying causes of violence against marginalized black and brown youths in the Americas, you can see many connections, said Martinez to NBC News. The Latin America and Latino Studies professor believes that US foreign trade and domestic drug laws make like mandatory minimum sentences and police profile have largely impacted many communities by escalating violence, forcing small farmers out of business, spiking immigration, and creating an environment where marginalized youths are targeted with state-sanctioned violence. Both Martinez and Arroyo use writing and art to challenge people to push beyond stereotypes, drugs, and violence. People often say, and you'll have to correct my accent because I always tend to speak Spanish with an Italian accent, eso pasa en Mexico. Eh, that'll do. That happens in Mexico when they think about drug trafficking and violence, said Arroyo. But that doesn't happen in Mexico or South America because people over there are more violent or corrupt. We are part of a larger global system and what happens in Mexico is connected with what happens in the United States. I'd like to be formal in the beginning. I'd like to welcome again Isabella Martinez and to read Andrea's biography to you. Andrea Arroyo, she is my friend. She is also an artist, curator, and cultural advocate. Her artwork has been exhibited in 40 individual and over 150 group exhibitions and is in the collections of the Library of Congress, the Smithsonian Institution, the National Museum of Mexican Art, and the New York Public Library, among others. Honors include 21 Leaders for the 21st Century, Groundbreaking Latina in the Award, Arts Awards, Official Artist of the Latin Grammys, New York City Council Citation Award for Achievement in Art, and many more. Her commissioned works include um, projects for the International Museum of Women and the New York Botanical Gardens and the New York Women's Foundation. Ms. Arroyo's work has been published extensively, including in the New Yorker, the New York Times, and the International Herald Tribune. She has been the subject of over 150 features in the international media. Arroyo Andrea is also a curator producing exhibitions tackling socially relevant issues. September 11th, Past, Present, Future, Art Without border, Borders, and Arizona Artists Respond to the immigrant Immigration Issue. Her current project, which is what we are going to hear about today, Tribute to the Disappeared, honors the victims of injustice around the world and features over 300 international artists. This is a wonderful program to have here today. It's wonderful to have you with us, and I'd like you to join me in welcoming Andrea Royal. Thank you, everyone. 
everyone. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Elizabeth Sackler, for the invitation, and thank you to Sackler Center. I'm very excited to be here. Um, I'd like to thank Isabel Martinez for joining us as well. I want to thank all of the tribute to the disappeared artists who are here. Can you raise your hands, please? Oh, great. God. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and thank you, everyone, for, jo for uh, joining us. I'm going to go through a lot of images. I'm going to try to be quick. Um, and I'm, gonna, I'm just going to show you. I'm going to uh, just tell you what the project is, means for me. Um, I, um, I have been interested in issues of social justice, especially women's issues, for a long, long time. Uh, I have been living in New York City for many years, but in uh, 2008, uh, there was a woman who was killed while, while she was jogging in uptown where I live, uh, in one of the parks. And I was shocked, of course, and scared and concerned. And uh, it was all over the news, and everybody was talking about it. And a few days, days later, later, the perpetrator was caught. And that got me thinking that women are killed in Mexico every day, and nobody really does anything about it. They are uh, six feminicides every day in Mexico. Uh, and I started this project that is titled Flor de Tierra, which uh, tra uh, the translation is Flower of the Earth. Uh, it's Flor de Tierra, homage to the women of Juarez. This is an exhibition shot of the project in progress. This is around maybe 80 drawings. Uh, I'm doing 400 uh, drawings for 400 women um, that have been killed in Ciudad Juarez across from El Paso, Texas. Um, each drawing is 12 by 9, and I use simple lines, uh, white lines on black paper to evoke the police chalk line uh, after a crime scene. Uh, this image is titled The Border, and uh, it's one of the, the drawings in the project. Um, global essential has a huge impact on, on women. In Juarez, for example, they started, the women started disappearing and being killed uh, after the Maquiladora set shop uh, south of the border. Uh, the official number for the women of Juarez Kill is 400. The actual number is uh, in the thousands. Uh, this is titled Reboso. And um, women in the maquiladoras, they work three shifts. So morning, after, uh, afternoon, and night. And um, these uh, corporations and the government, they, they provide really no services. And many of these women come from the southern states of Mexico to work there. Uh, just, I was just thinking of the, the fear that women go through when they go to work, like to or from work, uh, because they have to walk the streets, there's no security, no safety. So, and this is titled Cintura, which uh, translates into waist. Um, many of these women were uh, dismembered and tortured, and many of their bodies were left in the desert or buried in shallow graves. Uh, that's why the title is Flower of the Earth. And nobody has uh, been jailed for the crimes. For the 400 of official crimes, there has not been any arrests ever. So, I started Tribute to the Disappeared uh, in honor of people who are victims of violence and injustice. Uh, inspired, as Elizabeth Sackler said, uh, by the AIDS Memorial Quilt. And so far, 300 artists are participating. The project consists of three components. It's a virtual <coughs> quilt or an online exhibition. There's a series of physical exhibitions and a series of community workshops. Um, I'm going to skip this text. But, um, so I started this in November 2014, after 43 students from the Ayotzinapa Teachers College were abducted in September, on September 26. Uh, I uh, attended a demonstration in Union Square here in New York City. And I was there at the demonstration for about two hours, and then I went home, and I was just very upset. I, was, I felt totally disconnected. And um, the following, uh, following week, there was going to be another demonstration. They used to have them every Sunday. Um, and I was reluctant to attend. I was just, I, I felt really, really disconnected. So I, 
just went to my studio and got a tote bag and I threw uh, some paper and some Sharpies in, in a tote bag and, and left. And on the subway, I started to write the names of the, of the 43 disappeared students uh, on these strips of paper. And when I uh, arrived to the demonstration, I uh, asked people to help me finish because I hadn't finished the 43 names. And I asked people to help me pin all the strips of paper to my, to my coat. So I walked around like this. And, um, and then people really, they got close and they started asking questions. And it really showed me that, you know, it was a really different experience, basically. And uh, it made me realize that art, you know, touches people's hearts in, in a very different way. Um, I'm not a performance artist at all. So this is just me just walking around. And um, this was completely improvised. Um, but it really made me realize I, I felt connected, and a lot of people were coming uh, and just asking questions, and they, they were really engaged. So um, I thought I'd, I need to do something with art regarding this. So I uh, recreated the piece for in early 2015 um, using ink and ribbons, uh, and I wore this piece on the same way that I was wearing the, the paper piece, um, for the six month anniversary of the Ayotzinapa disappearances, when five of the mothers of the students came to New York to the UN. So I walked uh, in the demonstration in the march to the UN wearing this piece. And then it became more, more of a gallery piece. So it's again just ink and ribbons. Um, so the idea for me for Tribute to Disappear is to uh, create a mosaic or a, or a quilt of different images. Um, it started, uh, as I said, in November. By December, I already had the images from around 100 artists. And I started it as a Facebook page, and I published an image every day, a different image by a different artist. Um, so I invited professional artists, and I invited everyone else. So the youngest artist is 16. The oldest is 88. Uh, many artists are from Mexico and the US, but I have from all over the world. And the original goal of the project at that time, only a couple of months after the disappearances, was to uh, create awareness and, and generate uh, international solidarity. Right now, we are looking at 17 months later, uh, and the goal currently is basically to keep the light of solidarity alive. I think it's very important. So every 26, because of the disappearance happened on September 26, every 26th of the month, I uh, create and publish a new artwork that I make. And I, I just post a tiny little uh, update of how things are going. This was published in January 2016, just recently. And for these pieces, I use the same style as my Women of Juarez uh, project, but I use ink and digital media, the, where the Flor de Tierra project are uh, Conte on paper. This is titled uh, 43, Where Are Yous? And, you know, for Tribute to the Disappear, the concept of disappearance is uh, very wide. Uh, so it includes, of course, the forced disappearances, like the students of Ayotzinapa or the women of Juarez, but also disappearances that are done through uh, discrimination and invisibility and injustice. And this is titled 43 Sons, and this was published yesterday uh, to commemorate 17 months of the disappearances. Uh, this piece is inspired by a phrase that Mr. and Mrs. Tisapa, the parents of one of the students from the, from the college in Ayotzinapa, uh, have been using for 17 months. Uh, and it's, my son is your son and your son is my son. Um, when I met them in uh, last year, uh, they suggested that I create something with this phrase. It took me a long, long time to actually put uh, pen on paper and, and do it. Um, it's been a, a very emotional journey as well as, as you can imagine. Um, this is titled 43 Birds, Tribute to Nadia Vera. Um, the project is also about making connections. So journalists are killed all the time around the world 
and there's really, again, many times there's no accountability. Uh, Nadia Vera was a journalist who was killed in July 2015 uh, after repeated threats from the government of Veracruz in Mexico. Uh, under his uh, ruling, uh, we have uh, almost 20 journalists that have been killed or disappeared, and it's only in a, in a couple of years. Um, uh, a detail regarding gender, uh, when Nadia was killed along with three other women and a man, uh, the media reports mentioned only the name of the man. So they, they would say, uh, so-and-so who's a journalist was killed along with three women. So the, the names of the women were not mentioned. So again, just there's uh, invisibility and re-victimization re by the media all the time. Uh, so again, making connections. Um, this is, a, and I'm gonna start showing you now the, the art from the tribute to the disappeared artist. Um, this is a piece by a talented embroiderer from Guadalajara. Her name is Laura Patterson. And the text reads, the truth will not be silenced by killing journalists. And it's embroiderly on a handkerchief. Um, and Laura belongs to an art collective that is called Bordamos por la Paz, which is embro we embroider for peace. And they embroider cases of feminicides, murders, and disappearances on handkerchiefs, and that they display them in public spaces. This is a piece uh, by Tania Montes de Oca and his model Clay. And this is in memory of Annabel Flores, a journalist who was just killed in January this year, uh, also in the state of Veracruz, Mexico. This is a quilt by the amazing Silvia Hernandez, who's here. Thank you, Silvia. Uh, this is titled Morning, and it's cotton fabric and lace with machine piecing and quilting. And she used the photos of the 43 uh, students from Ayotzinapa, uh, lace, and a printed image of the Virgin of Guadalupe to create this wonderful, wonderful piece. This is another piece by Silvia. And uh, again, it's about connecting issues. Um, Right, with this one, you can really uh, think of the young men that are uh, targets in the US. Uh, the title is What's Going On, and it's cotton quilting. Uh, and I've shown uh, Sylvia's uh, original art in some of the exhibits. I usually show prints of the images, but the quilts I have shown um, as originals, and people love them. They're just uh, beautiful, and they're touchable, and they're just amazing. So this is a piece by Jan Imo, and Jan is an artist who lives in Scotland. And uh, she's very isolated, she, there are not too many Mexicans in Scotland. But uh, <laughs> she made 43 uh, portraits of the students in, uh, from Ayotzinapa, uh, from her studio there, and it took her months and months. And uh, during the process we were in communication and she was always telling me how isolated she, she felt, and the need that she had to actually do something, to create something good out of this horrible thing happening. Uh, so this is a portrait of Felipe Alnulfo Rosa, and he's the son of Margarito. And I'm going to ask you to just look at his face for one moment. And then, this is Felipe's father. His name is Don Margarito, and they look so much alike, right? This is a photograph that was taken by uh, Livia Dansky, and uh, she's a Brazilian photographer who lives in Mexico, or travels a lot to Mexico. This was taken in October 2014. Um, so right like a month after the students have been disappeared. And um, there were mattresses that were sent to the school, so the families were set, set there. Uh, the families are still living there. They have been living there for 17 months. Uh, it makes me think of a refugee camp, but in a country that is supposed to be at peace. So, please take a look at Don Margarito's shoes, just for a second. He wears these traditional guaraches, even to the demonstrations. Uh, last time I was there, we marched for, I think it was four hours, um, and he does that all the time. And then, these are his shoes. So there's an artist whose name is Alfredo uh, Lopez Casanova, and he collects the shoes of the, 
that the parents of the disappeared used to search for their children. So what he does is that he carves uh, the messages of the parents uh, on the soles of the shoes, and then he makes prints, right? Uh, the text reads, uh, I, Margarito Ramirez, am searching for my son, Carlos Ivan Ramirez Villarreal, a student from the Ayotzinapa College. He was forcibly disappeared by police along with 42 classmates on September 26, 2014. And there have been, since 2006, 26,000 disappearances in Mexico. This is another piece from the same project. Um, the text reads, Roy was disappeared on January 11, 2011. My name is Leti Hidalgo, and I'm searching for my son. The title of the project is Huellas de la Memoria, the Footprints of Memory. Uh, this is um, uh, a piece by Nicky Enright. He's uh, from Ecuador and he's based here in New York City. Another piece that uses footprints uh, as imagery. This is a photo by, again, by Lidia Danske, the Brazilian photographer. And this is, again, taken in 2014. It's a classroom in the Yotsinapa Teachers College. You see a bunch of chairs just in this array and with the portraits of some of the students. And then you can look at that classroom and then look at this classroom. And this is a photo by Ayano Hisha. She's a Japanese photographer based here in New York. And uh, she created a series after the tsunami in Japan in 2011. So it features devastation in, of a different kind. Uh, again, I'm trying to connect issues and connect people around the world. This is titled Missing 43, and it's a piece by Javier Arango. And uh, he lives in the Occidental Sahara, which is a uh, disputed territory mostly occupied by Morocco. So this is in the middle of the desert in Northern Africa, and 43 people get together, print the portraits, print the portraits of, the, of the students, and then get together for a photograph to send me for the project. This is titled Lost Boy, and is by Martin Kozlowski, uh, an American artist based here in New York. He's a political illustrator, and he's also the editor of Inks, a syndicate of uh, political illustration. This is Watercolor and Ink. This is titled Fourth of July, South of the Border, and is by Felipe Galindo Fego, a political cartoonist who's here. And uh, he created a well-known series titled Manhattan that celebrates Mexican culture in New York. Uh, the series tackles immigration and the impact of globalization through uh, humor. This is titled Mother of the Disappeared, and it's by Carlos Barberena, and he's from Nicaragua. And he's part of a printmaker's collective, uh, and this piece evokes the work of Mexican printmaker Jose Guadalupe Posada from the 1800s. Just traditional printmaker, uh, good printing. This is a piece by Denise Del Rey. She's here, thank you, Denise. Uh, she, this is the first piece that I got that was created on the iPad. And um, Denise is a talented artist, and she's also been a great supporter of the project. Thank you. This is a piece by Augusto, Met Augusto Metzli, and he's from Spain. And uh, it's titled The Student's Kites. It's watercolor, and it's uh, just a drawing of kites with portraits um, flying on the sky. Uh, recently, I, I was contacted by a Guatemalan artist, and he has this idea of creating a project um, to create, to make a kite to fly over the border of Guatemala and Mexico, which is also a very, very violent area. <laughs> This is a sweet piece by Sophie Blackall from Australia, and it's titled Disappeared. And just to evoke the concept of loss, is Chinese ink and watercolor on paper. This is a piece by Sue Ko, and she's originally from in, uh, England. He lives here in New York. And her work is uh, about social issues. He's, she's been working on uh, uh, human rights and animal rights for, since the early 80s. 
And this is Title 43, the piece that she made uh, special for the project, and it's charcoal on paper. This is a sculpture uh, by Celia Van Jul, uh, from Mexico. It's uh, titled The Abduction of Mexico, and it's Oaxacan clay. This is a photograph by Yael Ben Sayon, and uh, she's from Israel, and it's, uh, it's untitled. And uh, when I saw this image, it really reminded me of the, uh, the women of Juarez, and of the six feminicides per day that happen in Mexico. This is an artist book by Nancy Palubniak. Nancy is here. Thank you, Nancy. Uh, it's titled Sequence, and it's watercolor on folder, folder paper. Uh, it's almost like an artist book. And uh, Nancy does a lot of work uh, tackling the issue of violence against women. This is a piece by Deborah Solomon, and uh, she's a very well-known illustrator and animator. And um, this is titled Where Are the Graves? And it's lithocrayon crayon and watercolor. And uh, she published this image in a calendar in 1979, while she was in art school. And when I saw it, um, it, it really moved me, and I think it resonates uh, a lot today. This is a piece by Valeria Gallo, Gallo, from Mexico. She's an illustrator. And uh, she created a blog that is called uh, Ilustradores con Ayotzinapa, and she invited artists to create portraits of the 43 students from the Ayotzinapa school. Uh, she has gathered the work of many, many artists, uh, and they focus on creating actual portraits. Um, she uses embroidery uh, for her work. And this is Benjamin Asenso Bautista, one of the students. And this is fabric collage and embroidery. Uh, I met Benjamin's mother last year when I was in Mexico. And even before his son was abducted, uh, she had already an incredible story of survival. Um, she, uh, Christina also has a daughter. Um, we have to remember that most of these families, they have a, a son who has been abducted, but they also have other kids and families. And uh, they have been forced to live their families, their homes, and basically their lives uh, in their struggle as they search for truth and justice. This is Cristina Bautista. So this is Benjamin's mother. And, uh, you know, I sp last year I spent six hours in conversation with her. And uh, she's just a beautiful woman, warrior, and the hours that I, spoke, that I spent just talking to her just basically changed my life, changed my whole perspective. And um, I actually thought, think that I learned to listen, you know, after those hours. So this is Christina's family, right? Uh, that's Benjamin, who's disappeared, the boy, uh, you know, happier times. And uh, Christina's daughter is college age right now. The last time I spoke with Christina, she was still trying to get her daughter into college and was having problems due to bureaucracy and cost. And just the fact that Christina has been struggling to, to get uh, justice and truth for 17 months. Uh, this is from a collective of artists um, that is to, uh, the Bordamos por la Paz collective that we embroider for peace. And uh, the text reads, Mom, if I disappear, where do I go? Um, so this collective is a, a group of artists. They get together usually on Sundays on public squares, and they provide embroidery supplies for, to everyone who wants to participate. So it's led for, by uh, embroiderers who know what they're doing, but they invite everyone. Uh, I went to one of these sessions, and they were trying to teach me how to do it, and they, they, then they gave up. But, the, the, point, <laughs> but the, point, the point is that you know, everyone who comes and tries to do this, uh, it's, it's 
just investing their heart and their hands and their work for a few minutes or for an hour, just thinking of one person or, or one thing. They, uh, they usually embroider individual specific cases. Uh, so this is made by someone who's not a great embroiderer, but the message is beautiful. And the idea of the events is that everyone participates. So you go into the public square on Sunday and you see little kids and men and women and old and young, everyone trying to embroider, uh, trying to learn or at least trying to participate. And many of these pieces are created collectively. So if they have a phrase, they would, like two words would be embroidered by one, by one person and then another one by another, one, another person. So they, they become these just beautiful, beautiful acts of uh, creativity and love. Uh, this is by a beautiful uh, artist. He, her name is Laura Patterson, and this is another handkerchief that she embroidered. And the text reads, it was the state. Basically, it was the government. Very, very simple. The turtle is the symbol of Ayotzinapa, which means the land of the turtles. This is a piece by Maria Perez Santis from Mexico. She's a, from a collective called Malacate in Chiapas, and it's just titled Force Disappearance, and it's embroidery. Uh, I have published many, many pieces by this artist. Her name is Rosa Borras uh, from Puebla, Mexico. And uh, she created this piece in honor of the 2019 girls kidnapped in, uh, in Nigeria. And she used photos of, uh, from newspapers. So this photo was published uh, at the time, and she uh, used it and she created this uh, beautiful piece. It just the idea of an artist responding to a news piece or a photograph in a newspaper and creating something beautiful out of something horrible. And again, I'm trying to connect the issues, right? Nigeria and Ayotzinapa and Juarez. Uh, this is a piece by Virginia de Beque, and she's from Argentina. Argentina uh, suffered thousands of disappearances in the 70s during the dictatorships. And uh, there's a great uh, tradition of political art. Um, uh, the mothers of the Plaza de Mayo sit still there every Sunday after 40 years, many of them, of them still not knowing where their children were taken. Um, this is titled The Fall. So Claudia Fuentes is from a collective of folk artists uh, from Mexico, and they use traditional techniques to tackle contemporary issues. Uh, they use Mexican indigenous culture as a source of strength and inspiration. This is a wall hanging that took months to make. Uh, it's part of the exhibition 43 Hands for Yotzinapa, which with, uh, I collaborated with them. They sent me some works, and I sent some of the TV to disappear works to, to Mexico, and we had like a binational exchange of, uh, of art. And this is titled, We Are Missing 43. This is from the same group of folk artists. It's from Sabina Cesar Garcia, and it's titled Divine Favors. And it's edged copper and silver. And again, using craft uh, and folk art techniques to tackle contemporary issues. <coughs> kind of looks like jewelry or, or a rosary. This is by Santiago Sabi from Mexico. It's titled Flowering with Peel, acrylic on canvas. And uh, the traditional dress, the traditional with peel, is a source of pride and strength. And uh, these garments are usually treasured and they are passed from generation to generation. And the painting evokes a traditional burial. This is another with peel by uh, Ellen Benson. Uh, she's American, lives in Mexico. And it's titled La Yotzinapa with Peel, and it's collage using uh, newspaper clippings, antique textiles, paper, and a matchbox. Uh, this is a coat paper and watercolor piece by Wen Su. He's from Taiwan, lives in Costa Rica, and it's titled 43 Hands, 43 Eyes. Uh, a poignant piece by Jessica Lagunas, who's from Guatemala. It's titled In Memoriam, and it's an installation of, of a jewelry box with bullet shells uh, that includes uh, around 300 bullets, and that's the number of feminicides that were uh, taking place in one particular year in Guatemala. Uh, another piece that uses bullets, uh, this is by Ileana Hernandez. Uh, he lives, she lives here in, in the States. It's titled Life is Short. And it, you know, these two pieces made me think of the availability of weapons, both in the US and in Mexico, and the impact of the weapon and drug trade between the two countries. 
This is, I have a quite a few uh, abstract pieces in the project. This is by uh, Jane Murthy, she's originally from India, and it's titled Metamorphosis, and she creates these pieces during uh, performances. And this is a piece by Maria Esquivel, and uh, she's not an artist, she's my mom. So, <laughs> when I started the project, I called my mom, I was very excited, and I called, I said, Mama, I'm gonna do this, and she said, oh, okay. And I told her, you have to make something. And she said, no, I'm not making anything. I'm not an artist. And I said, well, you have to make something. She said, no, no, I'm not making anything. And a couple of days later, I received a photograph on my phone, just with the title on the subject, 43 stitches. So she created this tiny little piece with 43 stitches on each side. Um, and again, just uh, thinking of something that somebody who's not an artist can make something beautiful, just with their hands and their heart. Uh, this is by Lucrecia Urbano uh, from Argentina, and it's titled Urban Landscape, and this piece was created uh, as a collaboration with community uh, people. It reminds me of a shallow grave as well, but it's an abstract piece. So this is a piece by, this is food. So this is a piece by master food stylist. Um, team from Mexico City and Italy, and they're dear friends of mine, and I, would t I was telling them about the project, and they, they told me, we have to make something. And they make food, that's what they do for a living, they, they make and style food, so they make this as a food piece, and it's titled Chicken Hearts and Opales with Guajillo Chile Sauce. <laughs> uh, right? But again, they're not artists, they just want to make something and contribute. And also, I have been, one of the uh, components of the project is this um, a workshop that I present. I, I've been doing them in some of the universities and community centers, and um, the workshops are open to the public, anyone can come, and people, you know, we talk about the subject, and then people make things. They make pieces for the project. This was created by Sarah Shannon, and uh, it's titled Remember, and it's called Paper and Collage. And, um, I think, in a way, she was trying to connect Ayotzinapa with Black Lives Matter. Uh, this was created at the workshop at the New School for Social Research. And it was presented by uh, the New School and by the Dream Team and the New York Ayotzinapa Student Front. Uh, another piece created in a workshop at Columbia University. This is by Sasha Hill, a student at Barnard, who became a friend and a project collaborator and is still very involved today. Uh, this is an interactive piece uh, that is beautiful by Kyle Goyen. Kyle is here. Thank you, Kyle. And um, so this is printed uh, on reflective vinyl. So the portraits of the students are not really evident when you see them in normal light. But when you photograph them with a flash, they become alive, they appear. So it was, uh, it's just beautiful. Uh, this was a very moving mo moment that they tribute to the Disappear exhibition when the mothers, with five of the mothers of the Dis Disappear students came. And they, we were all taking pictures and they were, uh, they were really moved by the piece. Uh, we spent probably 20 minutes in front of the piece, which was just, uh, I was crying the whole time. But uh, it's beautiful, so thank you, Kyle. Um, this is, uh, again, the same piece. Uh, Ms. Hilda Lejideño is standing in front of it. Um, and uh, Ms. Hilda Lejideño is the mother of Jorge Antonio Tizapa Lejideño. Uh, this is a performance piece by Jorge Valdeón from Peru, and uh, it's titled Without You Until We Find You, and it's a performance. Uh, it's video, so basically what happens is that uh, a person stands against the wall, somebody else draws a silhouette around, they move, and the other person writes the name of one of the students. So they did for this 43 times uh, for the whole performance. This is a project by Chita Rodriguez, uh, who's also not an artist, and it's titled Clothes Lines for Ayotzinapa. Um, what she did uh, is she printed portraits of the students on 43 t-shirts. And uh, I don't know if you have this tradition here, but in Mexico we have the tradition after high school graduation, uh, people write messages on our shirts, uh, our friends, you know, farewell, keep in touch, you know, funny things, good things. Um, 
So she created this project and had this um, event in Pittsburgh where people wrote some messages. And then we were in communication and she sent the bunch of t-shirts to me in New York. And I uh, had them at the tribute to the Disappear exhibition and then more people wrote messages on them. And then when we were done, uh, we sent them to the parents in Ayotzinapa. So the, the teachers have the portrait and a lot of messages uh, from people from the community. Uh, so works in the public space. This is titled the Anti-Monumento, the Anti-Monument. And this is a public sculpture project that was created uh, totally in secret, developed in secret. Um, dozens of people were involved. Uh, one morning, they were on the main avenue in Mexico City, the equivalent of Broadway, which is Reforma. And uh, just dozens of people were there to install this piece. This is actually just steel, just, just like a regular public sculpture that just was created um, kind of like in a creative in, uh, act of defiance. And uh, it was installed in one morning, and everybody was sure that the government was going to remove it the day after because it was just, uh, they didn't have any permits, they didn't have uh, any approvals about anything, and you know, public sculpture has to have uh, all this process that is very long. So the sculpture is still there um, after 17 months. Um, and every 26th of the month, when the parents and the supporters march through Reforma, um, they stop here. The last time I was there, we stopped here, and the parents get in front of the sculpture, and they all say the names of the 43 students. And then after they finish, they keep on marching, and they usually go in front of the, uh, of the main Zócalo in Mexico. Uh, another project by a non-artist. Uh, she's Catherine Dominguez, and she lives in France. Uh, and this is titled A Thousand Cranes for Ayotzinapa. And uh, she was inspired by the Japanese legend that says that if you fall a thousand cranes, a wish will be granted to you. So she went home, and she folded a thousand cranes. Um, and this reads, uh, until we find them, hasta encontrarlos. And then she had the cranes, and she stole them in the main square in Toulouse, France. Just one cold morning, and then you can see you know, people interacting with it. Uh, there are other public, uh, forms of public intervention. This is uh, a projection, projection of the student faces uh, projected on the um, Palace of Fine Arts in Mexico City. And uh, it was during the Cultural Festival 43 events for Ayotzinapa. And the photograph is by Leticia Estrada and is titled 43. Uh, another public intervention, this one is uh, in Buenos Aires, Argentina, and this is the Mexican Embassy at night. So this couple of artists went there and projected uh, the 43 and the names of the students on the facade of the, um, of the embassy, and they recorded this as, as video. And uh, I got the video uh, online, and I was uh, looking at it, and you can hear their voices. They were extremely nervous because this is completely you know, they don't have any permits. It's actually dangerous to be doing this on, a, on an embassy. And Buenos Aires, Argentina has a history of repression uh, that is very, very uh, intimidating, I would say. So this project was also created in secret. Just they went with there one night and made this video. This is another public intervention. This is a group titled uh, Hijos, and it's a collective of artists, and it's titled Red Fountains. And they, the members went around Mexico City's uh, different squares and plazas, and they dyed the water red. So the, this was for the one year anniversary on September 26. This is one of the fountains, and this is another one. A very simple concept in a way, right? Uh, but it's just <coughs> a wonderful way to make people pause for a second. Uh, and this is a public installation by Elena Chubet, and she's uh, from Mexico. She works a lot of themes of feminicide. Uh, this is titled Red Shoes, uh, and it's an installation that has been going around the world. Uh, this is in Turin, in Italy, and uh, she creates these good community members. She gets shoes donated, they paint them red, and then they install them in public spaces. 
And more traditional public installation, just a mural uh, with paste, just pasted on the wall. And this is by Pancho Pescador. He's from Chile. And the text reads, alive, they took them, alive, we want them back. And it's a street, street mural in Oakland, California. And then I have another street mural. This is one is in Bushwick, and the photo is by Laura Anderson Barbata. And if somebody knows who painted the mural, please let me know. <laughs> uh, it's not signed, so we don't know. So it's in Bushwick. Um, so this is the tribute to the Disappeared Exhibition at the Shabazz Center. Uh, it's the installation. And uh, the Shabazz is a landmark building uh, from uh, 1912. And uh, it's basically a memorial to Malcolm X, X and, and Dr. Bey Shabazz. So you can see the statue of Malcolm uh, at the, in, on the stage. And I created this uh, exhibition, and, and I was trying to honor the space and the architectural features as well, and also activate the space in a different way. Um, making the connections between you know, Malcolm X, what happens now, contemporary life, uh, and also different communities in the area. This is in Washington Heights, which is a community with a lot of uh, Latinos and a lot of Eastern Europeans as well, uh, and African Americans, so I was trying to make those connections too. Uh, for the opening of the show, we have the Paul Sachs performing a song that he uh, wrote about the disappeared. And uh, I installed the images um, hanging uh, from wire. So when you, when you enter and saw this, like just people passing, yeah, the images, the paper would move. So it, it was a very, uh, the effect was uh, really amazing. And, um, so the, the images sort of look like they're floating on the space. Uh, this is the same exhibition, and this is the community wall that I created. These are, uh, this is during the visit of the mothers from the Yosinapa uh, students on September 2015. And here they are standing next to the participation wall. And um, I, what I had was an explanation of the project, and then we had hearts of paper where people ha could uh, write messages for the families. And when the, when the moms came, they also wrote messages for the community, basically thanking the New York community for the support. Uh, in the photo, we see Miss Hilda Legideño, Miss Angelica Gonzalez, Miss Hilda Hernandez Rivera, Miss Laura eh, Luz Maria Telumbre, and Miss Blanca Luz Nava. Uh, this is again the same exhibition, uh, um, the same uh, moms joined by Mr. Antonio Tizapa, who lives here in New York and who also does a lot of uh, activism through uh, sports and public demonstration. He runs marathons um, in honor of his son and his 42 classmates. And here the moms and uh, Mr. Tizapa are standing in front of 12 of the pieces that I had created for every month that uh, the student had been disappeared. Uh, this is the, uh, the exhibition that I, when I took the tour kit to the Women's Rights National Historical Gallery in Seneca Falls, uh, it's an installation shot. And um, so we see the images. I print the images in square format, sort of to get like a quilt or a mosaic, the idea of a, the concept. And uh, this exhibition featured around 2000, uh, 200 images and uh, also a community participation wall. So you can see you know, some of people just looking at images and then some kids actually writing messages for the families. And that's it. I have submitted articles. I'm going to skip through this. Uh, just Manhattan Times, The Flavor Pill, Viva La, Latin Correspondent, Native News. That's it. And that's all I have. Uh, <laughs> just one. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I, just one note, I, I invite everyone to participate. Everyone is welcome. I take new and existing images, and the artists keep the rights, and they keep the original work. They just lend me the image for the project. And I'm having an exhibition and a talk at Marshall University in September 2016, and probably another exhibition in, in September here in New York as well. So thank you. And now let me introduce uh, uh, welcome, uh, Dr. Isabel Martinez, to join me. 
uh, Isabel uh, is an assistant professor in the Department of Latin American and Latino Latina Just, uh, Studies and the director of the unaccompanied Latin American Minor Project at John Jay of, uh, College of Criminal Justice at the City University of New York. Her teaching and research interests include Mexican and Central American youth immigration, the US-Mexico border, and intersections of race, immigration, and technology. She is currently completing her manuscript titled Making Transnational Workers from Youths, and has several artic articles for comment. She received her uh, BA in sociology from Rice University, her master's in education po educational policy, practice, and foundation from the University of Colorado at Boulder, and her PhD in sociology and education from Teachers College at Columbia University. Thank you, Dr. Elizabeth Sackler, for joining us. I'd like to thank uh, the Brooklyn Museum and Dr. Elizabeth Sackler, Lena Sawyer, I don't know where you are, for helping us get settled, and Andrea Arroyo, whose work I've admired for many, many years. So thank you. Thank you. So I thought we, can you guys hear me okay? Yeah, okay. So Isabella and I were talking uh, four hours the other day. And um, I think this would be good to have as a conversation. So I'm going to just start by asking you, uh, what is your reaction to the images? Um, there are many reactions, <laughs> I think, like most of the audience. Um, I guess but one of the overarching themes I think of when I see these images is, you know, in this era of globalization, of economic globalization, and I think the globalization, we'll talk about this, I think, in, in a minute of, um, state-sanctioned violence. Um, I think what we're seeing is um, the responses to that, sort of this globalization of heartbreak and grief. Um, and that's what I think the images represent, the heartbreak and grief that we're experiencing all over the world um, and, and in New York City and all over the country and people's manifestations of that. And I think in a very productive way, one, one very productive way. Um, the other thing I think about, so there are particular images that I, I, when um, Andrea showed, I've, I've looked, um, before we even talked, um, I had looked at um, the exhibit online and particular images had jumped out at me. And the ones that really jumped out at me, um, there, there are two sets of images, or I kind of grouped them together. I'm not sure if they're supposed to be grouped together, but I grouped them together. Um, are the shoes? Um, both the shoes of the parents, so there's a series, I think, and, and Andrea asks us to look at the shoes of the father, then we see the two other images of the shoes of the parents, um, and then much later there's the exhibit, I think she's an Italian artist or, um, who has the red shoes in a plaza, maybe in Italy? Is yes, that it's it in is? Italy, Helena um, and, and I know this comparison has been made since 2014 about Tata Lolpo. So I don't know if anyone knows about uh, the massacre, La Matanza and Tatalolco. This happened, and, and ironically, the students of Ayotzinapa were organizing to commemorate this event. So um, October 2nd, 1968, Mexico City, um, college-age students the same age as the kids who, the, the youth who were disappeared in Ayotzinapa, are organizing in the Plaza de las Tres Culturas, which is a major plaza in Mexico City, a beautiful plaza in Mexico City. Um, and, um, and this is right around the time of the dirty war in Mexico, where I think kind of like today, there's pretty much um, unregulated state-sanctioned violence. Um, many, there are the numbers of, of, of youths who were killed um, who were who were in nonviolent protests against education reforms in Mexico range and again there are different accounts from hundreds to thousands never a formal investigation until 2000 maybe with um, Vicente Fox that didn't find any new findings and didn't lay blame on anyone um, but one of the mo so I first learned about this massacre through um, just the revered Mexican author, Elena Pontiosca, um, who wrote her book, La Noche de Tlatelolco, the night, the night of Tlatelolco, and she documents 
this massacre. And I want to say, and don't quote me, um, that her brother maybe had been involved. Do you know about this, Andrea? I'm not, I don't remember. But one of the passages, and I, all, I mean, it, it has struck, I read this book over a decade ago. It has stayed with me, is her, and she was a young woman. She was already a mother at the time of the Matanza. And she goes to the plaza, and all she sees are strewn shoes, purses, just personal effects of students who were either killed and blood, right? Either the personal effects of people who were killed, um, and of course, um, the bodies were, were carted off, um, or students who were just fleeing in sheer terror. Um, and so this, so I read it, it's always stayed with me, and now in Mexico City, there's a wonderful memorial to um, the, the, the students, the youth of 68 and Museo Memorial, I think this is in Tayocho, that also recreates that image. Um, and I, I was able to visit maybe five years ago that recreates that idea of just sheer terror and that moment of terror and young people fleeing. Um, and so those images of the shoes just immediately reminded me of that. Um, and the other image, I think, reminds me, so I'm a, I'm a professor, um, and all of my students are the same ages as the students who were disappeared. Um, and so when I see the desks and the empty desks, I think of, you know, this is very, this is, um, this could be my students who were disappeared, right? If we, if we were in a different context. Um, and we could argue about the dangers that my students are in here in New York City as black and brown students. And I'm a professor at CUNY, so that's the majority of my students. Um, so those are the images I think that most impact me and, and move me, so. Thank you. So what do you think are the, the connections between this, the issues that all of these images address? Um, so um, I have always been a use advocate. I work, I've been working with youth since I was in college, um, after college, and my research is, is youth focused. I do research on unaccompanied minors who first, my book is based on unaccompanied Mexican minors who, um, some of them were from the same towns and areas uh, where some where the Yotzinapa children, um, youth were disappeared, came from towns around there. Um, who arrived in New York City and entered directly into the labor market. Um, and now I do some work with the Central American youth who are in removal proceedings. Um, and so how I've thought about them and how I think about um, all of the um, youths in these images is that, um, and the youths here in the United States, is that I think these are, I think our youth are being preyed upon. I think these are acts of violence against a very particular age group and this age group, the Yotzinapa youths were between the ages of 18 and 29. The women of Juarez are very young. I think the official ages are between 12 and 22. Yeah. Um, the women of Boko Haram were between the ages of 16 to 18. Um, you, and, we could, and we know about um, the murders here in the United States against uh, mostly of African American, but also Latino males and females are also teenagers and young adults. So I, I cannot help but think that these are acts of violence that are specifically targeting this age population. Um, and also, I, we mentioned, and I don't remember if you have images, too, well, you have several images um, dedicated to the journalists, um, but we also, the journalists, human rights defenders are being forcibly disappeared. These are the truth tellers. And I think that youth are the most honest people and are also the truth tellers. So I also think that the truth tellers are being targeted. Um, so that's one. Um, I think that um, these are actions, these are acts of violence or state sanction, whether it's implicit or explicit that are happening in context of corruption, um, whether it's a failure to protect young people. So in the case of uh, the women of Boko Haram, um, I I've been, you know, had to prepare for this talk. Um, and I didn't know this, but I, I had found out, Amnesty International came out with a report that said that the Nigerian government had been informed for four hours before that attack had taken place that that attack was gonna happen and nothing was done, right? So that's a failure to protect those young women. Um, the sheer targeting of youth, stop and frisk, we can talk about here in New York City and who is disproportionately targeted for these types of policies that are acts of violence against youth. Um, actively denying justice 
to victims and their families. There are too many cases um, to think about here in the United States of exonerating police officers where we have evidence that there is some sort of foul play involved or um, illegal activity going on um, with the police officers and, and, and there was no need for um, that's what I'm looking for, uh, forcible force to be used against these youth. Um, <coughs> and so um, those are some. Um, I think there have been inadequate federal responses. I think, um, uh, um, you know, the Mexican government, I'll talk about Yosinapa and their responses. Um, it took 10 days for the federal government to get involved in the case. Um, there are videos of the Attorney General and his original attitude about discussing the kids of Ayotzinapa in almost this way that was, and, and this has um, sparked a social movement, Yamekanse, right? Um, he was already tired, and this was not, he's already tired of people disappearing in New Mexico, but he was tired of the questioning that had been going on in this press conference about this, and, and the real questioning of the federal government's investigation of this. Um, and femicides. I mean, femicides, um, I, I do not think the federal level have been acknowledged appropriately. Um, and, um, and there's a lot of indifference, I think, around that. So I think those are some things. I have two more things in there. Sorry. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> um, that I wrote out. Um, I think that all of these acts of violence lend a very clear and loud message. Oh, I see the time. Um, about who is disposable in our society and who is not. Um, black and brown young people, black and brown women are disposable. Um, and I particularly want us to think about the ways that um, these people are being disposed, right? So Michael Brown laid out on a street for four hours, right? Um, um, one of the kids that they did find um, in Ayotzinapa was found tortured with his skin, his facial skin removed and his eyes removed. Um, the women of Juarez are found strewn, and I know that you, you pointed to that image as it reminds you of Juarez, are, are found strewn in shallow graves just in the desert, right? And so I think the, the act of violence against them and the way that they are being violated, I think, speaks volumes about what we think about these people, about this group. Um, and then the other thing that makes me very angry or very passionate is um, the ways that the youth have been criminalized as, as victims, right? And we can talk about the way that the media has talked about many of these youths from, you know, Michael Brown, and, and then there's a lot of rhetoric around whether or not to use the photo of him in his graduation picture, he was a high school graduate, he was on his way to college, um, versus other images of him that showed him more casual, um, talking about drug use with these kids and trying to criminalize them. Um, the women of Juarez, um, there's always a discussion about good girls and bad girls and that these, were, these had to be bad women who were doing bad things. Um, and the Ayotzinapa youth, right? The original response is that they were members of a rival gang when, in fact, what these youths were were college students fighting for educational reform um, and collecting money to honor, really, the kids of Tlatelolco. Um, so I think those are all common threads. And, and you know, the youth of the girls of Boko Haram were, were going to school. And even after. Um, there have been other young victims in Nigeria um, who have been kidnapped by Boko Haram, and when they're returned, they're often stigmatized. They are either looked at suspiciously because they think, um, people think they may have been radicalized, or many of them come back pregnant with the child of a Boko Haram member, and so they're stigmatized. So across these youth groups who are victims, they're being criminalized. <sighs> I know, sorry, I was asking, no, no. I know this is not the art, I mean, this is not a very uplifting topic, the art pieces no, no, are good. beautiful and I think have hope in them, but I'm, I'm, I'm the cynic in every room, so. No, no, I, I think we all need to hear it. So, uh, what about women? Um, are any of these acts, uh, and how is gender come into place here? Um, I mean, especially in the case of Juarez um, and in Nigeria, you know, these are these are about structural. In all these cases, is about structural violence. 
But I think in these particular cases, there's another layer of sexism and the devaluing of women. I mean, you know, and and um, one other thing I want to add about, and I know that your work focuses on what is, you know, this is an epidemic that is spread across Mexico, that is spread across, and because my work is in Central America, and, and especially thinking about many of the um, young girls who are in removal proceedings and who have left El Salvador and Guatemala and Honduras, um, you know, they're, they're fleeing violence as well, um, and they're fleeing real attacks on them being women. Um, and then the, the, the mechanisms of control against the women um, are a little different, including rape, although we are seeing here in New York uh, young men who have been raped, who, who made the truck. Um, but I think that there are, it has been um, the layer of sexism and particular mechanisms of social control used against women. Um, Maybe we need to take a break for a Well, <laughs> no, we're, we're almost done. Um, uh, so nice. what are some of the ways that groups have challenged this uh, globalization of grief? So, okay, so this is the hope part. <laughs> <laughs> um, what I see, I, you know, for a very long time, um, I believe in coalition building, I believe in transnational coalition building, and I believe in cross-racial <laughs> coalition building. Um, one of the most uplifting things I've seen in all of this has been um, Black Live, Lives Matter um, activists mm -hmm. um, joining with Ayotzinapa activists in Mexico City and marching side by side with them. Um, and this is, this is part of a larger tradition, I think, of it's Black radical <coughs> traditionalism that, that, that talks about, you know, if I'm oppressed, I'm with my oppressed brothers and sisters wherever they are in the world. Um, and so I think that's very hopeful. I think that was, a, oh, that's one of the questions. I also see responses from young people. And I think um, one of the things that is different now, obviously, is technology, right? The, the facility and how rapidly students can bring attention to an issue, organize an issue, hashtag an issue, um, is pretty amazing for someone who, you know, when I was in college, we were just getting these nice, I think the internet was just about to take off. Um, and so, you know, I have, again, thinking about my young students, have students who ha are very aware of these issues, are mobilizing these, around these issues, and are using technology to draw attention to these issues. And I'm gonna shout them out just real quick, since we're gonna shout yeah. out. They can wave. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and they have a great website, changeequalssuccess.weebly.com, where they really, I mean, they, they themselves saw the connections between Black Lives Matter and Ayotzinapa and are talking about it and creating artifacts about it. So I think um, that's very helpful. Um, and then I also have seen um, Madres. So in terms of gendered responses, we're seeing mothers of the victims in Juarez um, marching side by side with the mothers from Ayotzinapa, which I think is very powerful. And I think with the mothers of uh, Plaza de Mayo in Argentina right. as well. Right, so, right, right, right. Yeah. So any, any other uh, uh, women responding that, uh, any other cases that you uh, sure. want to tell um, us about? There's been also, this is also something that I think is interesting, there's been pressure on the Mexican government. So right now there's an independent, um, I'll back up. So, um, there was a federal investigation that was absolutely debunked very early on. The explanation for what happened to the kids totally blamed on narco carteles. Um, the kids were, were burned. This was the official federal story, government story. The kids were burned and dumped in a, in a, in a trash site, basically, um, that was debunked. Um, and teams from Argentina came in and, and basically said there's no way that there would be, and there was no evidence of the kids. This was just a, a story that, you know, through forced confessions, um, they had been able to come up with. So one of, one, one kernel of hope, I think, too, is that um, an independent team of investigators has been brought in to investigate um, the disappearances. And the groups that are pressuring um, for the continuation of the investigation and for cooperation from the federal government, there's one great group, group of the Nobel, Women, Nobel Prize Women's Initiative, which again is transnational, uh, women from Iran, women from Guatemala, a US woman, women from Kenya, from Northern Ireland, who've come together and are using their status as Nobel Peace Prize winners 
to push for the truth to come out. And I think that's very powerful. Um, something, and then the last thing I'll, I'll just mention is um, there's another group that's um, women who've been organizing and fighting for justice to be um, um, justice for the women of Juarez um, for years and years and years have also taken advantage, I think, of this opportunity with this focus, this intense focus on human rights violations in Mexico, and have come up with a group called Pani Rosas Mexico, um, and they're calling it the other Ayotzinapa. Um, and so, again, try, and there's some work around how to label, I guess, right, um, the, the disappearances and the murders of the women in Juarez to be covered under um, human rights commissions and, and investigations. And so there's a lot of legal maneuvering too going on to bring justice to Mexico. And those are women. Yes. <laughs> those are a lot of women. Andre, so thank I you. you to open of course. Door. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, if anyone has any questions at this point. Yes. Hi. Hi. Uh, so what has been the reaction of the Mexican government to the sculpture, to all the art guerrilla workers you've been doing? Have they, have you gotten any reaction from them? As, was that, that sculpture that was put, the metal sculpture was a 43, has anybody like reacted or? Well, uh, the people who uh, created the project were sure that it was going to be removed the next day, but it wasn't. Uh, it was, people were actually taking turns to kind of guard it uh, for a few days just to make sure nothing happened, and then they started planted, planting flowers around, and uh, I think the government was just taken aback at uh, how some, uh, you know, a group of people can actually organize this well. And then people actually welcome the sculpture, like the, the whole community uh, actually uses it as, you know, as a memorial. So I think the government has been very surprised by all, by all of these uh, reactions and actions. Yeah. So, yes. Um, I'm interested, uh, you said you talk about uh, auras and Veracruz. Are there any organizations on a community level that you actually can have people like Community Watch where people get together so that that violence can actually be reduced or monitored? Because you said that there's a lot of young women that are being mm -hmm. targeted. Is there anything that's organically happening in these communities so that they understand there's a high level of violence against women that you get people together because people have husbands, they have brothers, they have, uh, you know, sons right. that can go out and work together so that this kind of thing is not, you know, what happening often. Um, well, there are, um, what can you call them, um, autodefensas. I mean, there's a lot of community organizing that's happening to, yes, to basically guard their communities. Um, but there's also a lot of fear, right? And we're seeing, I mean, it's pretty audacious to forcibly disappear 43 young people, and it wasn't hidden. This was, uh, it was at nighttime, but there are many, many witnesses um, that saw when this happened, who was involved, and they are terrified, right? And so, go ahead. No, ju just to know, they were taken by, uh, in police cars. So they were not taken on a, you know, unmarked bus or walking. They were actually just put into police cars and abducted. So, so there's no rage from the community, no rage. You see these people come in and take boys and they just disappear, like puff the magic dragon. And there's no oh, I think sense. there's rage. I think there's a lot of rage. And there's a lot of organizing and, and drawing attention to it. But. Um, I, I don't know. This is I was, this is the question I was afraid to be asked. Like, what's what is being done, or what can be done? I'm not. I think um, the allowing an independent group of investigators in is a good thing. I think that, and there's pressure for allowing at the state and federal level human rights uh, commissions, truth commissions, to do th to investigate. Um, I don't know. It just you know, my opinion. There's a uh, rage. And there's also terror. Yeah, there's fear. So it's. I understand that. Yeah. I guess my question is just: uh, you're expecting the people who are per perpetrating this injustice to change the injustice. 
That's my um, question. Um, you know, it's not about really expectations and um, a reality. It's very hard to understand fear. You want to go ahead? Well, let me. I'm going to. I'll back up for more. I mean, well, this is very obviously very complicated, right? And we have to understand a couple of things. One thing is, the U.S. is funding this. And I'll say this right now, we've gone from $3 million, and this is all in the name of a drug war, right? And, and framing those kids as the bad kids, or framing people who are not criminals, who um, justifying these attacks on them because they're criminals, right? We went from, the U.S. went from funding the drug, drug war $3 million in 2009 to $15 million in 2013, in spite of accelerating human rights abuses, right? So, I mean, how do we, I mean, and I say we, because we're part, I think we're part of the problem and solution, right? Um, how do we organize around that? Thank you. And the, just, and, oh, sorry. go ahead. No, that's it. Oh. That's just <laughs> time for one more question, maybe? Yes. Um, to, answer, to answer that, all right, I'm, I'm uh, Jennifer Louise Lopez, I'm the, uh, um, the executive director of Ethic Entrenched under NYC. And to answer that, what we do is we take our, our, our little, um, organizations that put together rallies. My organization puts, puts together rallies like that. Um, like when we see transgender people get murdered. And we put together a rally just like that here in New York City to get world attention to these um, to these things that are going on. Secondly, I haven't heard all night anything about transgender women being murdered. Last year we had 22 transgender women murdered. This year already, in, in the last two months, we've had over five transgender women murdered in the United States alone. In Brazil, we've had over five murdered, viciously attacked, being attacked by the police, and it all has to do, not all of it, a lot of it has to do with street work. And then when you call the police, the police don't do anything. Secondly, I have a lawsuit against the NYPD because when I call them as a transgender person to my, to, to my building to take care of things, they turn around when they find out that I'm trans and walk away and do nothing whatsoever. Thank you. And you're right. I mean, that's a great point. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. I'm not going to end this on a tough note because we can't end it. And it is tough. And I'm delighted that you're all here. I'm delighted and I thank you both. I think when I began my remarks at the beginning, I was talking about the three states that we are facing. The state of our nation, the state of our world, and the state of fear. This that has gone on in Mexico is not new. The United States has been funding coups, has been funding um, human rights abuses, in countries all over the world for decades. However, we're in a new moment. It's come home. It's home in a very new way for many of us who may not be people of color, or many of us who are Semitic who did not live through the Second World War. This has been going on for people of color in this country for centuries. It is now suddenly all right for people to have hate, to speak of hate, and to act on hate. It is not all right for us to do nothing. And the big question is, Doing nothing, we are complicit. And today, right now, we are complicit. And I wonder all the time, what can I do? It's one of the reasons I wanted to start the Sackler Center. It's one of the reasons I invite the people I invite. It's one of the reasons that Agitprop is out, is to remind everybody that we have to stand and we have to speak. And I don't know about you, but I will admit it, at this point, I too am afraid. I too am afraid. And what it will take for us to get over fear and be willing to put our own selves at risk 
what will it take for us to get there, I think we shall see. And I hope it will take something, and God, I hope that we have the courage, and if we don't have the courage, the balls, and if we don't have the balls, that we just simply say, no, this is not right and cannot continue. So I want to thank you, Andrea, because I think you have connected for us not only some horror for 43 children that we don't know where they are, but what is going on right here and, of course, as we know, uh, across the globe. I started two years ago um, a uh, program called States of Denial, the Illegal Incarceration of Women, Children, and People of Color. When I started that program, people didn't quite understand why I was doing that. Mass incarceration wasn't on the front pages, even though it was in all of our communities. And the, um, I think you had a wonderful way of pulling it, putting it, the institution, state, state-sanctioned violence. State -sanctioned violence. <laughs> it's not a phrase that we use in this country. And it may be that we have to start thinking about what it means and whether or not it's relevant to us. But we do have people who are incarcerated illegally in this country. We know that we have two and a half million people incarcerated more than any other country in the world. We have almost three million children, children in the United States who have, have one parent or more in jail. We have privatized prisons that are billions of dollars uh, businesses. They're huge, they're huge. So I started States of Denial, the illegal incarceration of women, children, and people of color. You can go online, www.brooklynmuseum.org slash EASCFA slash video, and you will see our last 13 programs. Our next one, and the first of our spring series is on March 13th. And Brian Stevenson, the wonderful author of Just Mercy, is going to be here, and he will be here speaking with Ray Hinton, who is the man that he, after many, many, many years, finally freed. He had been on death row uh, in Alabama in solitary confinement for nearly two decades, I think maybe more. So that will be our first program. And I'm also very pleased to announce that our Sackler Center first awards this year is June 2nd, and it will be going to Angela Davis. And, and she will be here, there will be a movie, she will be in discussion with, with uh, Gloria Steinem, and tickets will begin uh, at $50 and up, and they will be going on sale at some point. I don't think anything's hit online yet. But I'm so pleased to see so much energy and understanding of the issues that we are facing and the horrors that are currently existing. And we have to um, do something. So thank you, thank you both, and thank you all very much.